Welcome to Lecture 15, The Sun, Part 3. Today we reach the end of our three lecture series on the Sun. And we're going to end up, we're going to wrap up that section uh, by discussing a few, uh, a few interesting aspects of the Sun. Um, some historical, uh, in terms of our development of understanding of the Sun and, and uh, the connection between solar science and, and nuclear science and, and nuclear physics. Um, and then we're also go going to start talking in a little bit of detail about the sun's atmosphere, you know, which is something I've, I've mentioned before, the concept of a solar atmosphere, which is a little bit uh, different, uh, requires a little bit of, of thought to wrap your mind around it, I think, uh, just because uh, the sun itself is, is, uh, is a fluid, right? Um, it's, a, it's a plasma, not a solid. So as for the Earth, when we talk about an atmosphere, there's sort of a clear distinction between the Earth itself, the solid, uh, you know, Earth, and then the, at, the gaseous atmosphere that's, that's on top of it. Um, that, that distinction is a little bit harder to make with the sun, but, but there are ways to make it. And so we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about how we define that, what the, what the layers in the atmosphere are, um, and some interesting and surprising uh, discoveries that we've made in it. Um, this will also bring us to the midpoint uh, of the course, so congratulations for sticking with it so far. Um, and I, I appreciate you doing that. Um, so with, with that introduction, let's go ahead and, and dive in. So we're going to start off today by um, taking a little bit of a historical um, trip, if you will, back to the 1960s, when there was a, a discovery of something that has become known as the solar neutrino problem. Um, and it, as, as uh, you probably aren't surprised to hear, it has to do with those neutrinos that we've mentioned a couple of times that... Um, that very often we ignore, but today we're not going to ignore, um, which are produced in the first step of the proton-proton chain. So just to remind you, the proton-proton chain is a series of nuclear reactions um, that dominate the energy production in main sequence low mass stars. So that's the vast majority of stars in the universe, um, of, of which certainly the sun is one. The main source of energy production in the core is the is nuclear fusion of protons into helium right, in a three-stage process known as the proton-proton chain. So here I've shown you, you know, again, the, the first step in the proton-proton chain, which is just the fusion of two protons or two hydrogen nuclei to form a deuteron, right, which is, uh, again, a, uh, a hydrogen-2 nucleus, so it's another isotope of hydrogen. Uh, it has one neutron, unlike the, the most common form of hydrogen, but it's still hydrogen. Um, a deuterium nucleus, and then this positron and, and a neutrino, right? So we're going to focus a little bit on that neutrino um, for, the, for the first uh, several slides here uh, because um, the, the nuclear reactions uh, that, that power the sun have been understood for quite a while, and they were certainly understood in the 1960s. At least they were, it was thought that they were understood. Um, and, uh, and so it's straightforward to do a calculation. In fact, your, your textbook, uh, actually, uh, the textbook for this course kind of goes through and, and in some detail, actually does compute, you know, how much energy is produced in, in each of these stages of the proton-proton chain. Um, and then you can calculate, well, how much energy, how many of these reactions would you have to have every second in order to produce the you know, the power of the sun, which, which is something that we can, that we can figure out. Um, and so by doing that, you can figure out, again, what's the rate at which hydrogen is being consumed, you know, is being fused in the sun, and correspondingly, how many neutrinos be, are being produced. Okay, so that was a long-winded way of saying that as long, once we understood, uh, once scientists understood the, the nuclear physics uh, that powers the sun, it's fairly straightforward to calculate, okay, well, how many neutrinos are being produced every second? And then it's a very short calculation to again say, well, how many neutrinos should reach the Earth every second? Okay, so that's something that, that we can calculate. Now, you can thank me for not having you calculate that on an exam. I, I'm not going to do that to you, so you can sort of breathe, breathe easily now. But it's a straightforward calculation for, for scientists to do. Um, and in fact, it's, it's important uh, from a scientific perspective to do that because it provides a great test of whether we do in fact have our nuclear physics right, right? The, the physicists, uh, you know, the nuclear and the astrophysicists did these calculations. They thought they understood what the, again, what the nuclear reactions are that are powering the sun. Um, and, 
And they say, well, if this is right, if our theory is correct, then this is the number of neutrinos that should reach the Earth every second. Now, I've mentioned before that neutrinos went undetected for a long time, not just in this context, but as, as a subatomic particle, they were unknown for a long time because they're neutral, so they don't interact through electromagnetic, the electromagnetic force, um, and they're extremely low mass, um, so they don't interact in any meaningful way with the gravitational force. Uh, the only force uh, of nature, the only one of the four fundamental forces of nature that we know of that the neutrino interacts with uh, is the, or through, is the, is the weak nuclear force. And as the name suggests, it's a weak force. Um, and so the, the upshot is that it's really hard to observe a neutrino in general. Having said that, there are so many billions of these neutrinos um, that, that come through, you know, that are produced and come to the Earth every second, that actually there are enough to observe them. So even though, you know, if you just had one or a handful of neutrinos, the chances of observing those would be, you know, you know infinitesimal, uh, essentially zero. There are so many gobs of, of neutrinos that are produced by the sun and that do come towards the Earth um, that actually we can detect those. Um, it's not easy, but but we uh, we cared enough about it that we built really big detectors to do that. And so now I'm going to say a little bit more about that. So um, so the key, it, you know, in order to measure something that's really hard to measure is to try to measure a lot of them, right? Um, as I said, if you only have one neutrino, you're essentially not going to measure it. But if you have trillions and quadrillions and zillions of, of neutrinos produced, uh, you know, uh, every second for lots and lots of seconds, then, you know, if you sit there with a detector, with a, a, uh, a precise enough detector long enough, eventually you will, you will get some data. And you'll get, an, if, you, if you continue to take data for long enough, you'll get enough data that you can actually make a meaningful um, estimate or yeah, meaningful calculation of the number of neutrinos that are reaching the Earth. And again, using that, we can back out how many neutrinos must be being produced in the sun, which tells you again how many nuclear reactions are occurring. So I told you that we built detectors that can do this, and we have. There are a number of them around the world, but these are not small detectors, and these are not easy to make. So if you, you know, if you just stare at this, it, it can be a little bit hard to, to see what you're looking at. But if you look down at the bottom, you can see some men here uh, for scale. So um, this is a really enormous, uh, almost sphere, uh, spherical detector um, designed, this one happens to be in Ontario at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, um, designed to, to observe neutrinos. So if you're wondering what on earth this cavern is that it's in, these are buried, neutrino observatories are always uh, relatively deeply buried underground. Because as I mentioned, neutrinos are really hard to detect, right? So if you're going to look for something that's really hard to detect, you need to filter out all the other gobs of things that are easier to detect, right? Because when you detect a subatomic particle, the way that you do that is that you wait for that subatomic particle to interact with something else, um, undergo some sort of reaction. And as I said, in this case, that reaction is going to have to be mediated by the weak nuclear force because that's the only force through which the neutrino uh, interacts at all. So you need to have something that's going to undergo a, a weak nuclear interaction with the neutrino. Um, but when that happens, it's going to do something that gives off a, you know, a photon. Right. That, that's how you detect things, or at least in this case, that's how you're going to detect things. So you're going to have lots of, of detectors looking for this photon. Okay. The problem is that lots of reactions produce photons and lots of reactions that don't, that are not weak, lots of reactions that are strong, lots of reactions that are much more common than any neutrino interaction will also produce a photon. And so if you just put this detector up on the surface of the earth, you'd be totally swamped with gobs and gobs of reactions that weren't the ones that you were looking for, right? So somehow you have to filter out or, or beat down what we call the background reactions so that you have a chance of actually seeing the reactions that you're looking for. And so the way that we do that is by digging, you know, big holes, uh, you know, excavating large caverns underground. And so those particles that interact more strongly than neutrinos end up interacting with stuff in the dirt. They basically get filtered out and the neutrinos, which mostly just pass right through you, me, the earth and everything else, um, actually will make it into the, uh, into the, that detector. So the goal is 
pull every filter everything else out and make sure that the only things that are getting into that detector or at least almost the only things are those neutrinos um, so as I said there are a number of these observatories around the world um, this but but they all look kind of something like this and so it, you fill this detector with a with a lot of liquid something or other um, and that that's going to be the stuff that and you try to make that liquid something that you think neutrinos not that you think that that you know uh, neutrinos are a little bit more likely to interact with than some other things um, because again you, you want to try to make these reactions as frequent as possible even though you know that that they're not going to be very frequent um, and then each one of these cells on the on the side if you look at the there are lots of little you know sort of it's hard to tell how big they are but um, but they're you know, not tiny. Um, these detectors are, are actually uh, photomultiplier tubes that will receive the, the, that light. So again, if you have that reaction, that neutrino reacts with something in that tank. Um, it sends off a photon, that photon flies to the edge of the detector, is captured by one of these photomultiplier tubes, and then that causes a current, and that current is detected. And so that's, that's how the detector works. People spend their careers specializing in designing and building, you know, and, and improving detectors like this. Um, that could not be further from my own expertise, uh, such as it is, and so I will not go into detail on that. If you're interested, um, fortunately, the Google knows uh, knows plenty about it, so I invite you to, uh, to to look into it further. But for our purposes, here you've seen what a neutrino detector looks like now, and it's it's really big and it's buried deep underground. Okay, so now let's go back to the solar neutrino problem, because I've told you there's a problem, but I haven't told you what the problem was. So scientists did their calculations, they predicted the number of neutrinos that should be observed on Earth, and they told experimentalists, okay, go off and now measure and prove us right. Okay, so the experimentalists, they did a lot of uh, non-trivial work, built a lot of very uh, precise uh, detectors, and put them underground, and waited for the data to come in. And the data did come in, they got a number, and the number was almost exactly one third of the prediction. Okay. So, I don't know if you can imagine this happening, but this would be a big, uh, this was a problem, right? The solar neutrino problem. And the question is, where on earth are these, are the missing neutrinos, and why on earth is it, is it exactly, you know, more or less exactly one third of the neutrinos that we calculated is is what we're actually observing. So the first thought you have is, I, I did the calculation wrong. Somehow I, I lost a factor of three. So the theorists, I'm sure, went back and went through line by line of their calculation and eventually came to the conclusion that no, they had done the calculation right, at least, I mean, with the, with the theory that they had. So using the best theory they had at the time, they did the they did a correct calculation and, and the theory and the experiments just are not agreeing. They really do disagree. And so the question now is, well, what does this mean? Well, it turns out it means, you know, without digging any, any deeper, you can say immediately it means one of two things. The first possibility is that our current, our then current, anyway, understanding of nuclear physics is wrong. Okay. So in other words, I, I've told you, they did the calculation right. They did the math right. And so if the theory doesn't match reality, then maybe the theory is just wrong. Okay, so that's that's an obvious possibility. But the theory worked really, really well in lots of other areas of physics, right? The same theory, it's not like this was a theory only of neutrino generation in stars. The theory of nuclear physics, uh, as it stood in the 1960s, was very good and was very successful in a lot of different areas. And so it would be hard to, to understand uh, where, what was wrong with the theory. Um, as far as, you know, as, as far as how it was applied to calcul the calculation of solar neutrinos. Not impossible, it just, it was not an obvious, um, there was nothing obviously wrong with the theory. The other possibility is that the understanding of how neutrinos work is wrong, okay? Um, and this is an important point because the, what the theorists are calculating is how many neutrinos per second are produced in the sun, okay? But, and what the experimentalists are measuring is how many how many neutrinos per second reach the Earth. Okay, but but there's something in between, right? There's the whole traveling of the neutrinos from the core of the sun out to the surface of the sun, and then from the surface of the sun to the Earth. 
Um, and as, as we've said before, we know that it takes light a little over eight minutes, about eight minutes, uh, eight and a third minutes um, or so to get from the sun to us. So there's, and neutrinos travel at uh, very, very nearly the speed of light. So it takes a little over eight minutes for neutrinos to reach the Earth as well. So, may, so option number two here is something's happening in those eight minutes such that only a third of the neutrinos are able to be detected. Okay. So, so answer, so possibility one is the calculation was wrong because the theory is wrong, okay? Option two is, well, the calculation that the theorists did is right, but there's something happening in between the sun and the earth that is effectively subtracting out those the two thirds of the neutrinos. And if you had to pick which one of these is more probable, um, without you know, anything more than what I've just told you, number two comes off as, as much more plausible because neutrinos were much less understood um, in the 1960s than, than nuclear physics was. Uh, and this is not surprising because, again, neutrinos are very weakly interacting, right? It's hard to, it's hard to measure them. It's hard to find them. Um, it's hard to, to learn much about them, right? Whereas nuclear interactions are very strong um, and, and they're all over the place. And we, we can do them in the laboratory. We had particle accelerators that we were able to uh, you know, that we were able to, to use and make precision measurements on, on nuclear physics. So we certainly, we had a lot better data and a lot better understanding in general of nuclear physics than we did of neutrino physics. And so, you know, basically these two options boil down to there's something wrong with your nuclear physics or there's something wrong with your neutrino physics and all other things being equal, it's a lot more likely that there's something wrong with the neutrino physics. But still, for quite a while, this was, this was an outstanding problem and, and we just, we really didn't know where were these missing neutrinos. But it turns out that finally, after uh, 40 years, we discovered that in fact, we were missing something fundamental about the understanding of neutrino physics. So we won't go into a lot of detail about uh, neutrino physics in, in this particular lecture. There is some more detail in your text. Um, the key though, is something that we call neutrino oscillations. Um, and, and essentially what that amounts to is that there are three flavors of neutrinos, we call them. You know, physicists, as I've stressed over and over, are not very creative. Our naming schemes are not very good. Um, but so, so we call these things flavors of neutrinos. And, there, and it turns out that, in case you're wondering, they're called electron neutrinos, tau neutrinos, and muon neutrinos. Um, and the, elect the neutrinos that are produced in the sun are all electron neutrinos. The, the nucle nuclear reaction, the proton-proton um, fusion reaction, and then the weak interaction that converts the proton into the neutron, um, those uh, involve only electron neutrinos. Um, and so it, it makes sense that the detectors that were set up on Earth to measure the, the neutrinos were set up to measure electron neutrinos. Um, but it turns out that in, in the intermediate eight minutes, right, while the, in those 93 million miles, while, uh, while the neutrinos are traveling from the sun to the Earth, um, they, they actually do something called oscillate, so neutrino oscillations. And it's a fancy way of saying they get converted from electron neutrinos into mu neutrinos and into tau neutrinos. Um, and so they're constantly changing flavor as they come to the Earth. And the upshot is that by the time they reach the detectors on Earth, they're all mixed up. And so what all started out as pure electron neutrinos are now evenly divided, a third electron neutrinos, a third tau neutrinos, and a third mu neutrinos. And so when we do that, when we do our detection and our measurements, we correctly find that, well, only about a third of them are here. The other two thirds, the mu neutrinos and the tau neutrinos, they're actually here, but the detectors that were being used were not set up to detect those types of neutrinos. And so, so that, that, it turns out, was the solution to the, the solar neutrino problem wasn't an easy problem, it took 41 years to find out, uh, but the good news is that we, that we figured it out um, and now we know a lot more about neutrino physics on, on account of that. Having said that, um, the, uh, there's still plenty to, to investigate regarding neutrino physics and there, there continue to be ongoing experiments, very large scale experiments out of necessity um, to, to continue making measurements related to the neutrino and, uh, and understanding it more. So having said that, now I want to transition a little bit um, and talk about the atmosphere of the sun. So, you know, I've mentioned this concept several times over the last uh, 
I guess 14 lectures, uh, but here we're going to say a little bit more about it. Because now in the, in the first two parts, uh, first two lectures on the sun, we talked about the structure of the sun, uh, of the sun itself, the sun proper, right? With the core, the radiative zone, the convective, the convective zone, and then the, the photosphere. Um, now we're going to start from the photosphere um, and kind of work our way out and ask, okay, well, what's, what's the structure of what's outside the photosphere? Um, and uh, people can and do spend their entire career studying the solar atmosphere. We're not going to do that. Um, so we're going to start with this, with this figure here on the left. So you see the photosphere is, is called out here. Um, and that, just as a reminder, we call that often the surface of the sun. Right? It's not a hard surface. There is no hard surface of a ball of plasma. Um, but it's the surface at which the sun becomes opaque. Right? So we can see down through the sun's atmosphere to the photosphere. The photosphere is an opaque layer. Inside that, we can't see anything. So outside the, the photosphere, we have another layer, layer called the chromosphere. And, uh, and here on the right side, I've plotted at, at top the density and down at the bottom the temperature. Now notice that these are plotted on, log, on a log scale, and uh, this is common in physics uh, and astronomy, but in, in a lot of other fields it's not so common, so you may not have seen a log scale plot. Um, we're not going to do a lot of detailed analysis here, but I want to point it out because every, you know, when you go from 10 to the minus 5 here in density to 10 to the minus 3, you've gone up by a factor of 100. So this up here is 100 times uh, larger density than, than this, and 10 to the minus 5 is 100 times more dense than 10 to the minus 7, and so on. So these are really very large changes in density. Um, and so as you see, as you go um, above, the, as, you, as you sort of start from the photosphere and, and work up, um, you see the density falls, which makes sense, right? The, the farther you get away from the sun, from the sun proper, the, the lower the density of the atmosphere. Same thing is true on Earth, right? The higher you go up on, on Earth, the lower the, the density of the atmosphere is. Um, it continues to decline through the chromosphere, and then it falls, you know, quite a bit, um, very sort of precipitously, um, into the corona, and then kind of levels off. Okay, so. So right after the photosphere going up, you, you hit the chromosphere, and then you have a fairly large layer that's known as the corona, which is the, the outermost layer of the, of the, uh, the sun's atmosphere. Um, but what's, what's interesting is that while the density changes kind of, you know, in this fairly continuous way through the photosphere and the chromosphere um, before falling off to lower values in the corona, the, the temperature does something different. The temperature is relatively stable. I mean, it varies some in the photosphere and the chromosphere, but it's relatively stable. But then, all of a sudden, as it transitions to the, to the corona, it jumps up by a huge amount, right? It jumps up from around 10 to the, 10 to the 4 to above 10 to the 5 um, Kelvin. In fact, and, and then it continues increasing somewhat. So, in fact, the temperatures in the corona can be over a million Kelvin. Um, which I want you to pause and think about a little bit, or at least pause and let me continue talking about. Um, because when we talked about the temperature inside the sun, the sun proper, remember the hottest part of the sun was the core. And that made sense because that's where the nuclear fusion is happening, right? That's where all the energy is being released, right? And then that energy is just sort of finding its way out to the surface of the sun, either through radiation or convection, as we discussed. Um, but it made sense then that the core was the hottest, and then as you moved out, the temperature of the sun got, got lower and lower. You, were, you, know, you got bigger and bigger surface areas. The energy is, is spreading out over larger and larger volumes and, uh, and getting farther and farther away from the nuclear furnace in the core. So you know, I don't know how much you thought about that, but it, you know, to me it, kind of, it makes sense. It, you know, intuitively, that sound, it kind of sounds right, that the farther away you get from that nuclear furnace, the, the, higher the, or the lower the temperatures. And that worked up until we hit the photosphere. Now we start leaving the photo. We leave the photosphere, so we leave the sun proper. We're now in the sun's in, in the solar atmosphere, and now this temperature starts behaving really wonky. Now it kind of stays more or less consistent for a while, and that that's not too big of a problem. That that I think is is okay. But this massive increase in temperature, from you know order remember it's six thousand Kelvin or so on the surface uh, of the photosphere. 
and then all of a sudden it's over a million Kelvin in the corona, that's that should jump out at you and you know sort of as an oddity. So what on earth could cause that? Well, we'll say something about that. This is what, but before we say something about that, this is what the corona looks like. Now, the corona is usually not visible, right? At least, well, it's not that it's invisible. It's just that if we look up at the sun from Earth, we don't usually see the corona. And and the simple reason is that the corona, as you as you saw on the last slide, is very low density, right? So there aren't very many things in it, um, and the the brightness of the corona is completely swamped by the brightness of the photosphere, right? The sun is giving out gobs and gobs of energy every second. Um, and, and so while the corona is there, and it's giving out, and it's very hot, right? So you know it's generating radiation too, even though it's very low density. It's still, it's giving off um, radiation. So it's, it's visible. It's just that it's giving off so much less than the, than the photosphere is giving that under normal circumstances, you look up at the sun, you're just not going to see the sort of the, you know, the, the corona. Um, in order to see the corona effectively, you have to block out the rest of the sun. Well, there are two ways to do that. One is doing it on purpose with a specially built telescope, for example. Another way is just to wait for, for God to do it um, through a nuclear or a nuclear eclipse, yeah, through a, a solar eclipse. Um, and uh, and so that happens, and, and so the uh, and that has happened for a lot longer than fancy uh, telescopes have been around. So people knew that there was something out there that when there would be a, a total uh, solar eclipse, it was observed that there were these wispies out here that you can see on the screen. Um, obviously, historically, uh, it was not you know I think centuries ago it wasn't understood what this thing was, um, but it was understood there was some structure to the sun outside of that the disk that you normally see. It turns out, though, that not only, you know, I told you that the sun's brightness, you know, the, the brightness of the photosphere in particular so swamps the corona that, that under normal circumstances you can't see. But it turns out that if you look really closely and, and carefully so as not to just blind yourself, um, there actually is structure on the sun's surface as well. It's not just a uniform brightness. Um, and in particular, what, what we have known, what we know in detail now, and actually what sort of what surprised me is that these things have been observed for hundreds of years is what is known as sunspots. Again, not a very technical, that is the technical term, not a very creative term. But sunspots are what they sound like. They're dark spots on the sun um, that, that vary in terms, the sizes will vary, the number of them will vary, and we'll actually talk uh, very shortly about, about some of those variations. Um, but, uh, but sunspots, as it turns out, are basically nothing but cool regions of the solar surface. Um, you know, we, we regularly quote this 5800 Kelvin as a, the, the temperature of the photosphere, and it turns out that's the temperature of the, of the vast majority of the photosphere, but when sunspots form, these dark spots are quite a bit cooler, it can be, you know, on the order of 2000 Kelvin lower temperatures, so even a little less than, than 4000 Kelvin. I think I've, I've seen 3800 Kelvin is the number that I think your textbook uh, pulls out. So, as I said, they, they, from our vantage point, they're, you know, at least mostly randomly distributed on the surface. Some days there are more than others, some months there are more than others. Sometimes we don't see any sunspots, and sometimes there can be up to 100 sunspots on the sun at a given time. So, um, as I've said in a, in a number of other uh, places, people can and do spend careers studying this. Um, but, uh, but we're not going to spend our career doing that. Uh, you just need to know that there are sunspots. They're on the surface of the sun. They vary um, in terms of their frequency and size, and uh, and they're cool for for the sun. You know, say 3,800 Kelvin or something like that is sort of a good uh, uh, average number to keep in mind. If you zoom in, you see that there's actually even more structure than that. You know, it's not. You know, if you think back to lecture one, when we were sort of doing intro to astronomy, we kind of started out, you know, 10 million light years away from, from Earth or something like that, and then zoomed in. And every time you zoom in, you see more and more structure. Well, the same thing is true with sunspots. You know, from our, from our uh, Earthbound vantage point, if you look up at them, nor, well, if you just look at the sun, you don't see them at all, right? But if you filter out enough of, of, the, of the sun's light so that you can actually see some contrast on the surface, you can see it. And people, as I've said, um, historically, sunspots were observed um, by, you know, relatively, I don't know if I want to use the word ancient, I actually don't 
remember off the top of my head the very first observation, but certainly for hundreds of years these observations have been made. Um, but here, you know, our technology is better, and so you know, if you take a picture like this, which was taken by a uh, solar satellite, um, you can really zoom in, uh, and you see that you know it's not just just a, a dark spot, but it's there's there's variation. There's some darker dark spots, and there's some lighter dark spots. Um, and you have what's called granulation in there as well. So it's almost like you can zoom in and zoom in. And, and, uh, and what you would find is there are more and more structure at each level. And so, you know, all that is to say that uh, the physics that goes in, that's going on here is quite complex. And, and it's probably not a surprise. You know, if you have a, a ball of plasma whose temperature varies from, you know, almost 16 million Kelvin in the core out to 6,000 Kelvin on the surface, um, and then back to, you know, one and more million Kelvin in the corona. It's not surprising that there's some complicated stuff going on here on the surface, but sunspots are, are a great example of that complication. And actually they give us a, an important insight into what we generically refer to as solar activity. And we'll say more about that here shortly. Um, but speaking of solar activity, there are a number of different types of solar activity. And one of those is something known as a coronal loop. Not a very creative name, again. Um, it is what it sounds like. But um, there are a lot of there are explosions that occur on the, on the solar surface. There are, um, you know, there, there's mass moving around in lots of ways. Sometimes, and there are magnetic fields that we'll talk about um, more in a little bit. Um, but the sun's magnetic field plays an important role in solar activity. Um, and so one example of this activity, again, is a coronal loop where you get sort of loops of material um, that, that form on the surface. Another example of, of solar activity is what's called a solar prominence, which is very much like a coronal loop, but huge, right? And so, you know, when I say huge, I put Earth here, you know, as, as a uh, as means of comparison. You could obviously fit several Earths in here. I don't know, maybe it's 10, 10 Earth diameters or something like that. So this is really just phenomenally large. Um, that, um, you know, just it's a, a loop of material that gets shot out um, for, for a variety of reasons, some of which are understood and some of which are, are the subject of ongoing research. But, um, but solar prominences are some of the biggest features that occur on the sun. And I mentioned the term granulation earlier. Um, solar granulation is a generic term that, that you can sort of see here fairly well, I think, which just indicates the fact that the solar surface is not just a uniform surface, right? We very often talk about it as if it is. Certainly when we were talking about black body radiation and the sun's spectrum, and then, you know, applying things like Wien's law and the Stefan Boltzmann law to figure out, you know, properties of the sun, such as its temperature, we just kind of thought of it as, well, you have some uniform surface, it's radiating as a perfect black body, so let's measure the, the radiation. Turns out that approximation was really good as far as finding the, the sun's surface temperature, um, but the reality is that when we take these high resolution um, images of the sun using our, our best modern technology, we see a whole lot of structure. And this granulation, you know, is sort of apparent here, where you see there are brighter spots and there are darker spots, and, and you know, it's not, it is certainly not a uniform uh, surface. So plenty of, if you're interested, there's plenty of unknown science um, that you can go and, and study. Another example of solar activity, or so features that are characteristic of solar activity, um, is what's known as a solar prominence. You can see um, it... You know, the, the main thing that distinguishes a prominence from a, uh, you know, a coronal loop or something like that um, is just that it, it's not a loop, right? So um, in this case, you know, the, some, some are bigger than others, right? This particular one is over 50,000 kilometers um, in height. They can be larger, um, but, um, but you know, of course, they can be smaller. So anyway just another example of solar activity. All of these things happen. We measure all of them now. And, and now that, you know, with our modern technology, we have lots of uh, satellites trained at the sun. We get lots of data about all of these things. And finally, there's something that's known as a solar flare. Um, and, and a solar flare is you know, somewhat of a generic term, but this is one of the, this is the biggest uh, class of, uh, of activity, the most violent um, event that occurs on the sun's surface. And these things can be truly enormous. 
and, and involve energies that are really hard to wrap your mind around. Now, the latter comment is not probably a surprise since, you know, once we sort of started doing astronomy, most of the sizes and energies and things like that became hard to wrap our mind around. But these solar flares are, are, are and, and can be particularly gargantuan in size. And these are the things that we sometimes need to worry about. And sometimes you'll see articles in the, in, in the news and so on. Um, talking about solar flares and the danger that they pose um, to the to Earth, particularly as regards to its influence um, on the electrical grid. One of the ways that, it, well, in fact, the primary way that solar flares affect the Earth or can affect the Earth is through something known as a coronal mass ejection. Um, and, and these can go in tandem. So the solar flare can correlate with can give rise to a coronal mass ejection, which is, again, exactly what it sounds like. It's an ejection of mass from the sun's corona. And what it consists of is throwing off very large amounts of mass, not, not a large fraction of the sun, right? To the sun, this is a pretty small amount, but to us, it's, it's not trivial. Um, it's, it's the sun, it's a violent event, again, a solar flare, that ends up ejecting a significant amount of mass from the sun's corona um, towards the Earth. It consists of charged particles, which is not a surprise because that's what the sun consists of, right? Sun is a plasma, charged particles. These particles get shot towards, uh, well, just shot out, out into space. Um, where these things occur on the sun is random as far as we're concerned. Um, you know, a flare, we never know when a flare is going to occur or where. Um, we just know when it does we, because we can see it. At least we, we know, you know 8.3 minutes after it happens. Um, now, the, the sun is big and the Earth is 93 million miles away. So most coronal mass ejections will not be directed at the Earth, right? Thanks be to God. Um, some of them are. Some of them will be. Some of them have been in the past. We know it'll happen again. Um, and, of course, the, the more and more reliant we become on the electrical grid, um, the more and more dangerous these things can be to us um, if we don't have, uh, have ways to combat them. Um, and and the, the, uh, to put it in as much of a nutshell as I can say, the big problem with coronal mass ejections is that charged, moving charged particles or electrical currents um, generate magnetic fields. Now, in general, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from cosmic rays and any charged particles that would come in. So, there are constantly, the Earth is constantly being bombarded by cosmic rays, which consist of charged particles that are just moving through interstellar space. Um, but because, because the Earth has a magnetic field, those charged particles get deflected and they don't come down and irradiate us and, and damage us and plant life and, and so on. A coronal mass ejection, on the other hand, is so huge um, that the currents that are that are involved, because again, these are just charged particles flying right at the Earth, so they generate their own magnetic field, and there are enough of them that that magnetic field significantly impacts and alters the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so whereas under normal circumstances, the Earth's magnetic field is stable and strong enough to easily deflect any cosmic rays that are coming in, with a coronal mass ejection, you get so much current all at once um, that it non-trivially changes the, the Earth's magnetic field, and, it, and the Earth's magnetic field cannot block all of those charged particles. So when that happens, now the Earth's surface is suddenly bombarded with, all of, with a constantly changing magnetic field. Well, it turns out that cha changing magnetic fields induce electric fields. Um, and if you want to know more about that, that's really exciting. It's the subject of, uh, of electromagnetism, and I can, I'm can happy to talk with you in detail about that and or recommend classes that, uh, that study exactly that. For our purposes, what we need to know is that those changing magnetic fields induce electric fields. Those electric fields generate huge currents. Okay, um, When you apply an electric field to a conductor, you get a current. And so all of our electrical grid is is built up on this idea. Electrical currents sort of are the, I mean, that, that's what makes electronics work, right? Um, but all of our electronics um, are built to handle particular currents, right? Particular sizes of currents, um, particular magnitudes of currents. And with a, if a coronal mass ejection um, of significant size 
is directed, I mean, is impacts the earth directly. The currents that will be generated are in, in many, many cases much, much larger than our electronics, than our electrical grid is built to handle. And so what can easily happen is destruction, right? Um, and so, you know, if you, you read these articles, I'm sure if you haven't seen them before, I'm sure you'll see them now, now that you're attuned to the problem. Um, this, is, this is the reason that we are sensitive to coronal mass ejections is just because the change of the, the huge changes in magnetic field that would result will generate very large currents throughout our electrical grid. Basically anything that's that that is an electronic will have huge currents put through it all at once and that'll fry a lot of things. Um, and so so that's the problem. So and that's why people talk about the importance of hardening the electrical grid against that kind of thing. Now there are other things, uh, one, one particular one that comes to mind, that can generate large currents like that. And that's something known as elect an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. Um, and there, you know, historically there have been concerns that, uh, uh, well, certainly these things can be generated by nuclear weapons um, detonated high in the atmosphere. And so during the Cold War, this was, this was a non-trivial concern that, that we have had. Um, and uh, so I won't say more about that right now, but, um, but now you know what a coronal mass ejection is and you know why it's important. So I've told you that the solar wind is a stream of particles that travel away from the sun, um, and in particular they travel along um, open magnetic field lines. So the, the sun's magnetic field points out in, you know, out um, from the surface of the sun, and, uh, and you know, and that directs the, the charged particles because it turns out ch moving charged particles in a magnetic field experience a force. Um, and if you want to know more about that, again, uh, I refer you to a, a class on electromagnetism. Um, but importantly, the sun rotates, right? So just like the earth rotates on its axis, the sun rotates on its axis. Um, and so, and that has an important uh, impact on the solar wind because it kind of winds up the, uh, the magnetic field lines um, kind of like a sprinkler. And so instead of just pointing out, uh, you know, pointing radially outward uh, like you might expect, it ends up getting, getting wound up. And in fact, periodically as, as it winds, those magnetic field lines can start to, can approach one another um, to the point that they would start to cross. Um, and, and that actually leads to a process known as recombination, um, which is a, an important aspect of ongoing uh, solar research, something we don't understand perfectly, uh, but what we think plays an important role in solar activity in generating sunspots, uh, flares, and, and prominences, and, and things like that. So again, there's a lot of interesting physics uh, tied up in, in solar activity. Um, some of which we understand and a lot of which we don't because it turns out the physics, the hydrodynamics of plasmas um, is a really hard problem that people are interested in, but uh, plenty, plenty more people can, can continue working on that. So I mentioned the sun rotates. One interesting aspect of solar rotation um, that's different from the Earth's rotation is that because it's a plasma, because it's a fluid, a charged fluid, um, not, not solid, not all parts of the sun rotate at the same rate, right? This is something we don't really think about on a regular basis because the, the, the earth is solid, at least the, the crust that we live on is. Um, but, uh, but because the sun is, is not solid, it leads to a phenomenon known as differential rotation, um, which just means that different parts of the sun rotate at different rates. And in particular, the, um, the, uh, the poles rotate a little bit more slowly than does the equator. And so near the poles, it takes uh, roughly 35 days for the sun to, you know, for, for that part of the sun to rotate. Um, whereas the, the equator rotates more quickly and takes only 25 days to, to rotate. And so that does some pretty funky things to the magnetic field, which is, which is shown here. So the, it, it turns out that if you have a charged sphere that's rotating, it generates a magnetic field that looks that looks like this, um, and we haven't I haven't drawn the whole magnetic field, um, but the part of the magnetic field that's that's near the sun looks like this. Um, these arrows here, and at, but as it rotates, those magnetic field lines get drug along with with the material, 
And so what starts off as a, as a sort of a nice, you know, you know, symmetric looking, you know, set of magnetic fields gets warped pretty badly, pretty quickly um, as the sun rotates because the parts of the magnetic field line on the equator get drugged faster um, than do the parts near the poles. And so, as I said, this leads to some really uh, funky behavior. The funky in the sense that it's very different than what we typically see. Um, certainly, we don't see things like this when it comes to the magnetic field of the Earth because the Earth doesn't experience this differential rotation. So I mentioned uh, a number of aspects of solar activity and flares and prominences and sunspots and so on. Um, and the solar wind is part of that as well. Um, but it turns out that they, it, it varies. The, the level of solar activity varies over time. Um, and it, but it turns out that we've taken enough data that it has become clear that it, um, that it varies in a relatively predictable way. Um, and one of the easiest ways to measure this variation is uh, by measuring the number of sunspots uh, that we observe at any given, at any given time. Um, you know, and, and the reason is just that sunspots tend to be much more common. There usually are sunspots on the sun. Um, and so you can usually make this measurement, whereas prominences, the solar wind, and other sorts of solar activity are either less frequent or harder to quantify. Um, and certainly, you know, most solar prominences and things like that uh, are often not, and solar flares are often not directed at Earth, right? And so, um, whereas sunspots are just, you know, you look at the sun, you say how many spots are on the sun. And it turns out that by measuring those, we, we can generate plots that look like this, and not just that look like this, but that are exactly this, because this is real data here. Um, and what we find out is that the number of sunspots uh, varies uh, periodically with a period of, on average, 11 years. Now, it's not exactly 11 years every time. Sometimes it's nine years, sometimes it's up to 14 years, but on average, it's 11 years. And so what that means is that every 11 years, um, there will be a maximum in the solar activity cycle. And then in between those, those peaks, there will be a minimum in a solar activity cycle. And so if you look at the number of sunspots in 1980, when the sun was at a maximum in its activity, uh, there were you know, close to 150, between 150 and 200 sunspots. Um, and then when it came down to a solar minimum, there are times where we measure zero sunspots. Really. So, so it, it, it really does vary that much. Um, but you can see that it's, uh, you know, it really is periodic. It really is about every 11 years that, that you have a maximum. Now, having said that, not all maxima are equal, right? So there are times, you know, back in 1980, again, we had a peak that was, you know, I don't know, maybe 160 sunspots, pretty similar number around 1990, 91. Um, in 2000, uh, or a little after 2000, uh, maybe 2002, it looks like it was a little bit lower than that. Um, and, and so sometimes the maxima are, are bigger maxima, sometimes they're, they're smaller maxima, but basically on average every 11 years you have a maximum in the number of sunspots, and at the same time you're going to have more prominences, you're going to have stronger solar wind, um, and basically everything that goes along with, with increased solar activity is, is happening there. So more solar activity means more sunspots, means more prominences, means more solar flares, and so on. Um, and along with that, every 11 years, the magnetic field of the sun flips direction, flips uh, polarity. And so the, the north and the south magnetic poles are flipping every 11 years. Um, to put that in, it, to put the, and contrast that with something, you know, the Earth's magnetic field also flips periodically, but it's tens of thousands of years uh, for the Earth. So the sun is much more magnetically active than the Earth um, in, in several ways that we've talked about. But as I said, the sunspots um, are, are certainly the most important way that we measure the solar activity just because it's the easiest. And I mentioned that we've taken uh, sunspot data for quite a long time. I mean, not, not you know, since ancient Greece, um, at least as far as I know, we don't have any ancient Greek data on sunspots, but certainly there were sunspots um, uh, for, for the last several hundred years. Before, 19, before 1645, the data is very sparse. Occasionally, an astronomer would make, would make a measurement of, of sunspots, 
but it wasn't something that was, the importance of it was not yet known, and so it was not something that was sort of universally paid attention to. Uh, in the, starting in the late, uh, or in the 16, around 1650, in mid-17th century, uh, people started taking data more, more regularly. Um, and what's interesting is that at that time, there were very few sunspots um, that were recorded. This is something that's known as the, the Maunder Minimum. Um, and there were almost no sunspots observed from the mid-17th century to the early 18th century. Um, I, I'm a little bit ashamed to admit that I know next to nothing about the Maudner Minimum. Uh, it's really intriguing to me. Um, my first thought is, well, maybe they just really didn't know how to measure sunspots and they just didn't look hard enough. Um, I suspect there's more to it than that since it has a name. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that's it. this stands out to me as something that I'm going to try to find the time to look, look into this more because um, it certainly stands in stark contrast to what happened after that, um, because starting in the early 1700s and on to the present, we've seen a very regular 11-year um, cycle in solar activity. As I said, you can see that, that what this peak, the value of the peak in terms of the number of sunspots varies. It's not, you know, it's not like you always have 150 uh, sunspots at the peak and then, you know, zero at the minimum. Um, but but nonetheless, it's very clear you have a, a, you know, a, an average 11-year cycle here. Um, and, and that's useful for us, right? Because you know, the goal of science generally is to find, categorize, and understand patterns. Um, and so this is certainly an important pattern that you know, allows us to, to sort of, well, it grounds us in terms of trying to develop physical theories of, of the sun and its, its evolution and dynamics. Because if you want to, you know, if your theory of, of solar activity is going to be right, it obviously has to has to explain or at least um, predict this this 11 year activity cycle. So I've said a little bit about this already, but now I want to say a little bit more about how does the solar activity or how does solar activity generally affect the Earth. So the Earth is protected from most solar activity uh, by with I mean like the solar wind um, and you know, sort of uh, more punctuated things like solar flares and coronal mass ejections um, by its its own magnetic field. Um, and if we, this were, of course, in geology, we would spend some time talking about the Earth's magnetic field and how it's generated. The short answer is that the, the Earth has an iron core. That iron core, it, it's it, at least partially liquid. And so the, uh, the magnetic, the ferromagnetic core, which is moving, generates a magnetic field and, and and that's a good thing for us uh, because that protects us from, from not just the solar wind, but from high energy cosmic rays as well, which would otherwise do damage. Um, and what tends to happen is that the, the, the charged particles are sort of deflected. You know, they, they're coming towards the Earth, but then they encounter the Earth's magnetic field and they're deflected along the magnetic field lines. Um, but what that means is that for most of us living, you know, sort of not at the poles, the, the, you know, we're protected from these particles. These particles are directed away, and then they, they come in, though, along the magnetic field lines. At least some of these particles come into the Earth along the magnetic field lines um, at the North and South Pole. And so all those particles that you thought were, you know, that you were escaping, well, if you go up and you stand at the North and the South Pole, these particles actually will, are, are more likely to get in. Um, and fortunately, it's really cold there. People tend not to live there. But it also produces some pretty cool effects with which you may be familiar. And it looks like this. So I confess that I've always wanted to see the northern lights. Um, I guess I would be OK seeing the southern lights as well, which is exactly the same physics. It's just down on the, the, the bottom half of the globe. Um, I've never actually seen them in real life, but fortunately, thanks to YouTube and so on, you can go see, uh, see them in real life, um, uh, if not in person, uh, pretty easily. Um, and normally they're green. You may have seen pictures of these as well, but it turns out that if you're at the right place at the right time, you can see lots of, of different colors. And as with anything else, those colors um, just have to do with the, the electronic states, or, you know, the atomic states in whatever atoms and molecules are in the atmosphere. Um, so some lines are going to be stronger than others, and so you know, the, the green tends to be strong. Um, that comes from oxygen for what it's worth. Um, but, uh, but nitrogen can produce blues and reds, um, and oxygen can produce red as well. So there are a number of different colors that you can see, and, and all of these things are coming 
from the, the charged particles coming from the solar wind being directed um, along magnetic field lines into the Earth's atmosphere um, near the poles. So the reason that, that the northern and southern lights are only typically seen near the poles is because that's the only region where the, the solar wind, where those particles are being directed in towards the Earth. They're being deflected from, from the equator and the tropics and all the sort of the center part of the globe, but they're directed in near the poles, and so that's where the, the northern and southern lights occur. Now, um, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a little bit, but during increased solar activity, and certainly if you have uh, something like a coronal mass ejection, um, or even something not that big, but just a smaller flare or something that, that sends more than, than usual numbers of charged particles towards the Earth, then you, uh, then you are more likely to see um, the, the northern and southern lights um, somewhere farther away from the pole. So there are times in, you know, in relatively rare cases where you will see this same effect much at much lower latitudes. Um, and, uh, and so I'm always on the lookout for these things, but I, mean, I haven't seen one yet. So if you have, I'd love to hear the story. And here's another, another picture that makes you think like this can't really be real. This is just somebody photoshopped something up, but, um, but no, this is real right place, right time. So, um, I would recommend against, you know, spending, you know, $5,000 to go fly to wherever this was taken, because chances are this happens like one day out of, you know, 1500, but um, fortunately somebody had a camera there at the right place at the right time, and so it's real. And finally, one more. I'd like to say this is near Iceland. I'm not sure why I think that, but Iceland gets some really nice um, uh, views like this. So, uh, and, and this is sort of the more typical green, you know, greenish color coming from the oxygen. So. You know, the, the last thing that, that I'll wrap up with here now on, on the, in the context of solar activity is we've already talked about how solar activity can, can mess up our, uh, the electrical grid, right? Um, and not just what we think of as our normal electrical grid, but it can, it can mess with radio communication because anything that involves electrons, right, um, which is a whole lot of stuff nowadays, right? So it can mess with navigation. Um, certainly, anything that, that, well, our satellites could be damaged um, and possibly completely destroyed. Um, and while large coronal mass ejections are not very common, um, we do have some relatively recent data. Uh, and in particular, in March of 1989, there was a huge coronal mass ejection, um, which managed to knock out power in the entire province of Quebec. I don't know what the population of Quebec is, either now or then. But it's not small, right? Um, it's a pretty a decent sized area, um, and you know, just completely power out. So I mean, imagine power out in the entire state of California, um, and maybe everywhere west of the Rocky Mountains. I don't know. You know, um, the point is that this, you know, we've seen this happen, and and it really can happen. Now I don't know how long it took to get it back up. I actually don't think. I think it was. Uh, I, I certainly. I don't think it was a week. I think it was down for a day or so um, in general. I'm sure some places took longer to get back up than others, um, but don't quote me on that at all. If you're interested in this particular event, and, you know, this is obviously a very modern event. There's lots of uh, information, I'm sure, available. Um, but at the same time, you know, Aurora, so the northern lights were visible as far south as Florida, you know, so you could have been on the beach, you know, in Florida. And, and seeing the northern lights. So that, I mean, that's, that's crazy. So these things do happen. Um, I, I hope that when I do get around to seeing the northern lights, it's not because, you know, that, that uh, the electrical grid, you know, across, you know, the western United States is, is out. But, uh, but I guess, you know, it, at least if we do lose the electrical grid completely, maybe, a, a, you know, we can take solace in, in the nice views that we can get since God knows we won't be getting the internet anytime soon. So, uh, and at the same time, you know, several space satellites lost navigation because, of course, they're using, you know, radio communication to sort of maintain their orbits and, uh, and so on. And so, you know, if they're accustomed to making slight adjustments to make sure that they stay in a stable orbit and they lose contact, well, they'll, they'll veer off course and may or may not be able to, to recover. So, uh, and the other thing is, I mean, 1989, 
is is pretty modern, right? That that was in my lifetime. I was six at the time, for the record. Um, so I don't think of that as very long ago. Um, you probably think of it as longer ago, but uh, but in any case, you know, certainly the the electrical grid and our um, reliance on technology has has increased exponentially since then, um, and and can, will continue to do so. I think for some time, right? So you know, things were not it was not good in 1989. I think the damage would be um, would be worse today, um, and so as I mentioned earlier. That, that's why people talk, you know, about the importance of hardening the electrical grid against um, this type of, uh, of problem, this type of damage. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not a cheap thing to do at all. And I have to say, it's as a result, it's easy to talk about. It's really hard to convince people to spend money um, on on something like this when it's such a low, I mean, a relatively low probability event any given year. Now, there's the probability that this will happen at some time, at some point, is one. You know, the probability is one. This will certainly happen, but but we don't know when, and and we don't know where it'll be directed, um, and you know, and so it becomes very difficult. And we know that it won't be frequent, right? So so as a result, even though we know it will happen at some point with absolute certainty, we don't know anything more than that, really. Um, I mean, we and we can make estimates about how how frequent it will probably be and, and things like that. But but it's hard to estimate how bad it will be and so on. So so you know, my, my guess is that people will continue talking about the importance of, of doing it and then probably not do a whole lot. But um, if you have any suggestions how to avoid that, um, let me know or somebody that can actually make a difference there. So anyway. Um, that brings us to the end of the Sun Part 3, which brings us to the end of the series of lectures on the Sun and to the midpoint in, in the course again. So I appreciate your attention. Thanks for sticking with me. If you have any questions, as always, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you back for Lecture 16 as we move on to Part 2 of the course.